uh, right behind those authors. So he's doing one heck of a job, and who knows where he's going to be in, in five years from now, but we're lucky to have him here today. So James, come on out. Thanks very much. Good morning. Everyone hear me okay? Yeah. All right. This is a fantastic event. It's a great room. I'm so appreciative uh, to Jim for inviting me to do this. I'm usually uh, politely removed from these types of rooms instead of invited to speak in, in front of them. So uh, this, is, this is a treat for me. Uh, as you said, I am uh, Jay Thorne, James Thorne. Uh, you, can, you can call me either one. Uh, this is my uh, website. It is the portal to everything. So everything I'm going to speak about this morning, uh, all the elements and everything, you can, you can find it here. Uh, I thought I would start with a uh, really short bio. I create. Thank you. All right, so let's get into it. I'm going to ask you a few questions, and if you could just give me a show of hands, uh, that, would, that would be great. So how many of you like to know how to successfully complete a task before you start it? Raise your hand. These are good. You know that, right? How many of you like it when someone offers their help with no strings attached? Of course. So the bigger question that I have for you then is what if I told you leaning into the unknown and doing things for others without expectation is a way to become successful? And I think uh, I heard Joe speak about this a little bit uh, right, right before me, and I think you're going to hear this over and over again today. I know many of the presenters, and I, and in speaking with them and talking to them, I think they've had some very similar experiences. So I think what I'm presenting is not necessarily unique, and it's not the only way, but it's, it's my story. So I'll share it with you this morning. I hope you enjoy it. About five years ago, I was really into epic fantasy. I was not writing anything of my own. I, I've written my whole life different things, uh, technical stuff, a little bit of journalism, but I was not a novelist. And in 2009, I was really into this phase. You know how you get sometimes into those phases where you only read a certain genre of fiction, you really get into it. Maybe you stay in it for your whole life, but I was in this period where I was really into epic fantasy. And although I love uh, Peter Jackson's interpretation of Lord of the Rings. Reading Tolkien is uh, challenging. Uh, I, I enjoy it, but it's not easy reading. And, and so I was kind of reading all this epic fantasy, and everything I was reading was good. But I kept thinking, like, wow, this is, this is good, but it's not the exact story I want to read. So I had this crazy idea. Why don't I write the story I want to read? Uh, I think probably many of you have had that revelation, whether you articulate it that way. You've probably had that experience where you go, you know what, I can, I can write the story that I want. And so that's what I did. I picked up a copy of Stephen King's On Writing. Whether you write horror or anything else, doesn't matter. If you, you know, write on the back of napkins, you should, you should read that book. Uh, and I kind of followed his uh, template. And it's, it's a bit dated now, I think. Self-publishing and, and current trends have changed the way readers uh, get, get books and get entertainment, but I, I just thought I was going to kind of follow, follow what he said, I mean Stephen King, right? So I said, why not? I've never written a novel before. I'm going to write a 180,000 word epic fantasy. Why not? Sure. So I did that. But that really wasn't the story, right? So part of on writing, uh, Stephen King talks about writing a first draft, and he says after the first draft, he likes to set it aside. I don't know, six, eight weeks, some arbitrary amount of time. And in between the time he finishes that first draft and when he goes back to revisions, he writes something else. It's completely different. So he basically says, I like to you know, cleanse my palate. Uh, he, wrote, he writes a different type of genre, so I thought, okay, my, my main goal, I'm going to write this epic fantasy. I'm going to be the next you know, George R.R. R. Martin. And uh, in the meantime, I'm going to write this one-off book called The Seventh Seal. It's going to, I, I was really into 
sort of post-apocalyptic fantasy, and I thought, ah, oh, why not? Was, I wrote this tongue-in-cheek. I, I thought it was tongue-in-cheek. It was kind of, I was really free and loose with it. But I really enjoyed it. I was, it was just sort of a mental exercise. I really had no intention of doing anything with it. Uh, so that came between drafts. And it just so happened that in uh, 2010, 2011, right about that time, dystopian uh, fiction really started to catch on. Uh, not necessarily zombie fiction, I know The Walking Dead was really kind of coming into its own at this time as well, but more just dystopian, uh, post-apocalyptic genre fiction. And, and so uh, it just was good timing, and it wasn't planned, it just kind of happened. So I'm going to show you some screenshots later on, and I thought it was important to show these as well. Uh, I'm, I'm very transparent. I know that uh, sales figures and rankings and things like that prior to the self-publishing revolution were, were sort of cloak and dagger, and, and publishers didn't release that, and you didn't get uh, sales for into the sales figures until like six months after and, and it was just, just this weird kind of thing But these days you can you can get a ranking on Amazon and you can get a range of how many books are being sold it, It's pretty open information. So I'm going to be completely transparent with you uh, and part of that is uh, This little spreadsheet that I keep uh, these are my royalties for 2011 uh, you can see I made uh, I made four dollars, and uh, yeah, thank you, thank you. I was pretty excited about that. Down here, this is really interesting. I had a huge holiday season in 2011. Um, I, I didn't hit the international market yet, but domestically it was killing it. Uh, I, I'll also confess, and I'm sure you've all done this or you will do it. Uh, as soon as your book publishes on Amazon, you, you buy a copy of your own book. Of course you do, right? So these, these do include my, my own purchases. Thank you. I told you I'm going to be honest with you. That's the truth. Uh, so I guess it was more like six sales. I don't know. Uh, I had so few sales in 2011, Amazon wouldn't even send me a check. They're like, it's not worth the paper to send you the royalties. So I had to wait until February of 2012 before they would send me a check. My first one was for $19.26. Uh, I got this notification via email. I forwarded to my wife and I said, I'm done. I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna write a letter to the boss. I'm quitting. Uh, we've made it, honey. And she was like, yeah, whatever. And that was it. That, that was pretty much it. So uh, this, is, this is what I call planting the seed. So I know it's, it's daunting. Many of you are probably at this place or have been here. I have been here not that long ago. Uh, something that's really important that I wish someone would have told me at this time was everybody starts here. Everybody starts with their first book and it's probably the one, it's probably your own purchase. And that's okay, you've got to start somewhere. So as we move into 2012, some really interesting things start to happen in the industry. How many people have heard of uh, KDP Select? A few of you, okay. So I, I know uh, we have a, a good mix of fiction and nonfiction uh, writers in here, but really uh, Amazon kind of changed the game for, for self-publishing. And in 2012, you may have heard the term the Kindle Gold Rush. Uh, I, I can't say I've benefited from any type of gold rushing of any kind, but uh, it was really a moment. And what happened, and for those of you that aren't familiar with the story, is Amazon rolled out a program called KDP Select, where they allowed authors to put uh, books, their books for free, for five days in a 90-day cycle. And uh, a few very uh, entrepreneurial uh, authors founded something called the Free Party. Anyone ever heard of this or been on the newsletter at all? Okay, one person, yeah. So the, the concept was getting your book uh, for free on Amazon didn't really help you because what happened was if you put your book for free, and this is still true today to a certain extent, if you put your book for free on Amazon and, other, and there are people looking for free books, and there they are, <laughs> 
There are, there, are, there are hoarders that want as many free books on their Kindle as they can possibly get, and they don't care what the books are. The open rate on a free book is like less than 1%. So what happens is, you put your book for free, people download it, the one free books, and they go and download all the other free books they can find. So in your also bot queues, you get cookbooks, and you get technical manuals, and it doesn't really help, because what you want in your also bots, primarily you want your own books, but you want other books that are like yours. That's what helps you. So what these, uh, the indie, it was called the Indie Book Collective, it doesn't exist anymore, but I found them just by chance, and what they were doing is they were offering their books for free on the same day and then cross-promoting. So what they were doing is sort of trying to populate their also bot queue with other books that were of the same genre. And they did it with a dedicated website. So I found this organization, uh, and mind you, at this time I'm not selling anything, right? So I figure, giving a book away, well, I'm not selling it anyways, you know, what's the harm? And I tend to, I have a technical background. I do, I've done websites before, and they were looking for someone to build out the event pages once or twice a month. They wanted to make a website that they could send a newsletter to, and then people could download these free books. And uh, I said, yeah, sure, I'll do it. And, and, and they said, well, in return, we'll give you a spot in these events. And I thought, okay, you know, I know a little bit about this stuff, but nothing about book marketing. And uh, I didn't know exactly how to make the site the way they want, but I said, sure, I'll do it. And then I said, oh boy. <laughs> I just agreed to something and I don't know how to do it. I'll figure it out. So at the same, you know, five minutes after I agreed to do it, I started researching on how I was going to build these websites up. So I take, they're, they're looking at my catalog, my very short catalog, and they said, you know what? Post-apocalyptic genre, the, the fantasy genre is kind of hot right now. Can you put the seven seal on the event? And uh, I said, yeah, sure. You know, I, again, I wasn't, wasn't, uh, it was the burden of conquest. It was my epic fantasy. I was really thinking, like, that's going to work. I'm going to hit a home run for that. So I, I showed them the cover, and they're like, no. <laughs> no, you can't use that cover. And I'm like, what? I, I made it in Photoshop. Uh, it was like, come on, it's nice, right? And they're like, no, you absolutely can't use that cover. You've got to find a new cover. I said, okay. So I contact a local guy who uh, is a graphic artist. Gary Kane is a great graphic artist, but he doesn't do book covers, and you'll know, and, and Derek's gonna, you'll hear from Derek later, who's a master in this stuff. Just because you're a graphic designer doesn't mean you can make good book covers. Uh, so he, I paid him uh, handsomely, I'll say over $100, and when you're making, selling 11 books a year, $100 is a lot of money. Still a lot of money for me. Uh, and he made me a great cover, and so I go back to the Indie Book Collective, and I'm like, here you go! And they're like, no way. And I'm like, but it's cool, it's got the Cleveland thing and motorcycles and planets and the big eye, and they're like, no. And it wasn't that the cover was bad, but it didn't reflect the genre. I mean, it's sci-fi, that looks sci-fi, doesn't it? They're like, so they're like, that, that's not gonna work. So at this point, I'm almost ready to give up. I'm like, okay, I, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what a good cover looks like. I, I'm not selling any books. Maybe I just walk away from this and cut my losses. But something told me, just kind of stick with it. Uh, they put me in touch with a cover artist, and that is the cover that came out. And if you, you can probably see the progression. <laughs> uh, and that particular cover, and I was uh, talking to Brian Cohen about this earlier, sometimes you can't really figure out why a certain cover explodes and why it's embraced. And this, this one did. So for some reason, this particular cover caught the eye of, of everybody, and in one of these events, I put this book in, and that happened. I had 34,000 downloads of that book, and this is in, uh, this, this is April, this is more like late, mid-March to late March of 2012. So I had the whole Kindle uh, gold rush thing happening. I'm really benefiting from that. I'm part of this event. My book's getting featured. I got a brand new catchy cover, and it gets downloaded 34,000 times. 
And now I'm, I am elated. Like, I can't even tell you how excited I was for this. Uh, I really thought, wow, this is, this is it. Like, this is, what I, this is what I was thinking, what I've been dreaming about. But there was a problem. The problem was I still didn't really know what I was doing. I didn't have the book professionally edited. I'm a writer. I can edit. I can proofread. I, yeah, you're laughing, right? I'm telling you, I'm being honest. This is, this is painful. So, <laughs> so in March, I get 34,000 downloads, and the book is starting to get out there. And the reviews start coming in. <laughs> okay. So maybe that person's just having a rotten day, you know. All right. Do I really need an editor? I didn't know people got editors for books. Okay. Okay, you know. Okay, uh, it's, I, it's just awful. No, it's god awful in caps. It's an embarrassment to literature. It's not even worth finishing. And the best one yet, I wish no stars was an option. Dear Amazon, this book is so bad, please give me a no star option. I can laugh about this now. I told Jim this story at lunch, and he's like, man, you got to share that. <laughs> so I, I'm putting myself out there. I'm, uh, I was, you know, when you, so, when you publish, you're vulnerable. Thank you. I mean, this is all public record. The reviews are still there. Uh, the point was, like, no matter how bad it seems, there's, there's something there. There's an opportunity. So I quickly, I, I spoke to some of the uh, authors in the, in the free parte, and they were all seeing what's happening, and I was like, you know what, I'm unpublishing that, I'm, I'm done, like I can't, I, my ego can't handle that, I'm a fragile, delicate flower, and I can't handle that. And, uh, and, and she's like, no, you, know, you, got, you gotta stay with it, uh, get it edited fast, get it up there, so I did that, and, uh, and even the first edit wasn't great, and I still got some, some uh, one-star reviews about the editing and the content, and so I, it's been through about seven different editors by now, and now I'm just like, you know what, it is what it is, I don't care. <laughs> and if you look at the reviews now, they're kind of U-shaped. So you have a big, you have five star of people who really enjoy it and kind of get it, and then you have the one stars that are just like maybe reading the other reviews and, and piling on, and I, you know what, I don't care. That book is what it is, and it's going to stay there. Um, but what I also, but what I learned from this experience is that there's certain things that you could be doing, and I call this watering the garden. So as you're writing and as you're publishing, there are other things that you can do to help sort of establish yourself. Blogging is really important. I know it's kind of old school, and I know it's been around, and everyone's got a blog, and every blog has an average readership of one. I get that. But it's more about you. It's more about finding your voice, developing your style, and it's about being consistent. <laughs> being a writer is about being consistent. Uh, the, uh, I heard a Bruce Lee quote, I'd rather uh, face a man that's, uh, what is it? Anyone heard that quote about a thousand kicks? Yeah. Right, I'd rather face a man that's done a thousand kicks at once than a man that's done one kick a thousand times. So the point is getting that consistency, right? That's what blogging does. It forces you to be consistent. If you pick a day and you say, I'm going to blog every Monday or every Wednesday or I'm going to blog every third Friday, you're holding yourself accountable. You're developing consistency. You've also got to experiment. I experimented. I, uh, I started out with an epic fantasy. I wrote dystopian. Now I'm writing primarily psychological horror and dark fantasy. Uh, I experimented with format, so short stories, novellas, novels. Uh, you you kind of really have to experiment. Uh, I got uh, revisions, so I upped my game on formatting. Uh, you know, as I said, I'm an IT guy, and so uh, I was you know, really working on the formatting. I've rewritten my product descriptions hundreds of times, hundreds. 
because it's sales copy. It's not a summary of your plot. The product description is meant to sell your book, not tell people what the book is about. And that, that's different. Uh, I experimented with pricing. 99 cents, dollar 99 cents, which is no man's land, don't do that. 299, 399. Uh, and I just, I, I'm, I was searching, trying to figure it out. So I'm still trying to figure it out. You'll, you'll try and figure it out. Uh, I'm not necessarily presenting a single path that's going to lead you to success. You're going to start to experiment. You're going to see patterns emerge that are going to work for you. I also made a decision in 2012 there are certain things I cannot do. <laughs> I cannot edit my own work. And that should have been obvious after the Seven Seal reviews. And now, now it's perfectly obvious. I've got a great editor now. Cover design. Yes, I can work in Photoshop. No, I cannot design book covers. So I pay for those, and it's well worth it. So whatever, realize what you need to outsource. Here's another example of sort of evolution of how you need to keep experimenting and keep refining. So Prentice Brown became book one of my Hidden Evil trilogy, and I found this charcoal drawing of, uh, this is a, this is a Preto Aragaki, if you're, I don't know if anyone's familiar with Eastern mythology, but it's this sort of wandering spirit creature, it's really interesting, and I kind of based this series on it, and the creature's never satiated, it's, uh, there's a, there's a lot of parallels to, uh, to sort of our modern life, but in East, Eastern philosophy, the Gaki or the Preta is sort of this wandering spirit that's never satiated, eats really disgusting stuff, has an ex you know, the belly is extended and it's never full and it just keeps eating and eating. Uh, and so I found this charcoal drawing, I bought it off the artist, I thought, great, good book cover. Not really, kind of gross, not very appealing, white, white, no, not me, right? So I found, uh, I found another design. You can see I incorporated the uh, charcoal drawing. I had the artist incorporate that. So I have a, uh, a second version of this. Even still, it didn't sell well. It's better, but it didn't sell well. And this is what it looks like now. So again, you can kind of see, you have to experiment. You have to keep refining. I think there's, a, there's almost a sense that once you publish a book, you're done. You're never really done. And I think, you know, that's both, both a blessing and a curse in self-publishing. You can keep refining and keep refining forever and drive yourself crazy. And at a certain point, you've got to stop. At the same time, you can keep making things better. It's always a new audience. Okay, this is going to, uh, this really hurts. It hurts for me to even say this. Remember that epic fantasy I started with? That became the first two books of the Burden of Conquest series. Uh, I followed that up with a historical fantasy called Goal Within based on Jamestown and a short novella I did as part of a project with my band at the time. That represents a total of almost a quarter of a million words. And each one of those I have subsequently unpublished. They are no longer available because they were terrible. <laughs> they were terrible because it was my early writing and I was trying to find my voice. They were terrible because I was still learning my craft. They were terrible because they're not my brand. They're not my brand now. So if you think about that, um, it, it's a little depressing. You know, I have a quarter of a million words that I, that I wrote and I ed had edited and I published and I did covers and I removed them. Uh, and that was a hard decision, but I think it's, did you start earlier on? Uh, and I think every author who has more than one book will tell you this. You're in love with that first book. You think it's the most gorgeous thing in the world, like along with your kids. Uh, and, then, and then as you get some distance from it, you realize that you grow as a writer. And it's not that not all of your books will be as bad as mine were, but mine were really bad. So hopefully yours won't be as bad. So as I mentioned, I started unpublishing. This is around uh, 2013 as I'm starting to write more. I'm, I'm continually writing. I'm unpublishing as well. I'm keeping up with the blogging. Uh, I, I think since 
mm, 20, late 2011, early 2012, I've posted every Monday. There's a hashtag on Twitter called Monday Blogs. I don't know if anyone's aware of that. Rachel Thompson kind of started that movement. It's a great way to get uh, some exposure. You, you tweet out a blog post with um, the hashtag Monday Blogs, and then other people will retweet that. Uh, and it's good because it's not salesy. You know, it's not like pushing a book. It's, pu it's pushing a, a blog post. It's entertainment or it's information. I started experimenting with price pulsing. So what I started doing is using 99 cents during uh, low volume time. So typically between uh, on the weekdays, Monday through about Thursday is sort of the, the dip in the week for book sales. So I would keep it at 99 cents to encourage sales. And then on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, when the when volume goes up, I would I would price my books at $2.99. And then on Sunday night, Monday morning, I'd drop them back to 99 cents. So what I was trying to do is get some volume with the low price, get some royalties with the with the more expensive book when I knew sales volume was going to be higher. You have to play with this though, because clearly, and I'm sure this this goes without saying, the cheaper book is going to sell more. Like 10 times more. So uh, you will take a hit on your royalties uh, you know, when you drop to 99 cents, but you're going to sell probably 10 times as many books. So you have to figure out what you're looking for. Are you looking for exposure or are you looking for royalties? And this is also when I started to realize that for genre fiction, writing in a series is critical. It's really hard to write good standalone because you leave the reader nowhere to go. And if you think about the, the Netflix model now, and you think about how TV and movies are serialized, I mean, you're going to hear from, from Johnny and Sean later today, the masters of serialized fiction, and what <laughs> they've been able to accomplish, and creating a sales funnel, leading readers into that, and keeping them there. So in any way that you can write in a series as a, as a genre fiction author is really going to benefit you. And because of my technical background, I started to experiment with box sets. And I'll talk, I'm going to talk about more about those in a minute. One of the things that I realized early on is I have, I have two skill sets that I've worked hard to develop and I think I'm pretty good at. Uh, one of them is I have a technical background. So I know a lot about HTML and CSS, and you might be like, what's that? doesn't matter. The point is, what I, what I was able to do is translate those skills into book formatting. So I figured out very early on how to format books for Kindle, and, and, and that was the skill set. The other skill set that I have, and I'll finish with this, is I, I'm a good project manager. I, I, logistically, I can see the pieces, and I know sort of who I should ask to do what. So in a project, I can kind of take a lead and make sure that the end product gets finished. What you should be thinking about is what is your skill set? What do you shine at? And it's going to be different for everyone, but you all have it. You all have something you know you're good at that's related to this industry beyond just the writing. So be thinking about that because that's what you can offer to other people and that's what's going to help build, build your own brand. So what I started doing is I started going to authors who I admire, who I was fans of, and I started saying, hey, your next book, let me format it for you. You need it on CreateSpace and on Kindle, I'll do it for you. Let me do it, let me help you out. With no expectation. I honestly did it because I believed in those authors, and I also wanted to kind of fine tune my chop, so I knew I was good at formatting. What better way to get better at formatting than to do more formatting? So maybe for you, it's graphic design. Maybe you're pretty good with Photoshop and you want to get better. Offer to make a cover for someone. They may ignore you completely, and that happened to me. But along the way, uh, I started offering, and I just kept offering myself. And, and, and I did it because I really liked what these authors were doing. I'm fans. Um, Scott Nicholson's a perfect example. Anyone know Scott Nicholson? All right, so Scott and I have developed a great relationship, and because I, I'm a fan, I've been a fan of his since before I started writing, and, and now we have a really good professional relationship, and I'd like to believe it's because I wasn't, look, I wasn't asking him for anything, I was offering him something. So I released a little book, uh, this is free on Smashwords and everywhere else, it's $4.99 on Amazon because I'm trying to get those suckers to price match it to free and they won't do it. 
Um, so please don't buy it on Amazon. Go get it for free at Barnes & Noble or Smashwords or Kobo. Uh, but it's formatting your ebook. So if you have a little technical skill and you're like, oh, formatting, I might be able to do that. Grab that, uh, that'll help you out. So I put that out there for free uh, and I started with my own. I started putting together these box sets and they, uh, these box sets help me to not only write in series, but also get more experience with formatting multiple titles. So I won't get into the real technical stuff on this, but the idea is that on Amazon, if you buy one of these box sets, it contains four or five or more novels in one transaction, one title. And as an author, that's what I want. I don't want you reading my book. I want you reading my series. So what I'll do is I get, you know, the first book in the series might be free or 99 cents or cheap, and I'll make the box set maybe a dollar more than the most expensive book in the whole series. I'm driving the reader towards the series. I want them in that funnel. I want them in this, and then I take them from one series to another. So what's the result of all this? So I, I utilized my, my existing skill set. I refined it with the technical side, the project management, and I uh, started offering my, myself to other authors to try and help them out. And so I, I, I showed you this and got a good laugh out of it. Uh, really, what started to happen then is this kind of stuff. And these, these are the screenshots. I'm, I'm much more proud of these than I am those one-star reviews, but I'm going to show them to you. Uh, you know, I, there's the one box set, the multi-author box set, the first one we did in February. There it is on the top 100 horror set between King and Coons. I, I, it's my favorite screenshot of all time. I'd love to see my name there. So, all of this, this is, I call the reaping though. This is where a lot of this is all coming together. It took time, it took me a few years, which in the grand scheme of things is not a ton of time either. Um, here, this is a screenshot of my author rank and author central from the time they started it until this week. And this is where I started doing multi-author box sets and offering myself to other authors and doing things for them. So I think that's a really powerful visual that will show you the power in offering yourself and how it does come back to you. Call it karma or goodwill or whatever you want. It's real and it works. I'm proof of it. So what that led to is I started, these authors who I first started helping uh, said, hey, you know what, we should do a box set. I'm like, you know what, you're right. I'll format it. I, I, I won't even take a cut. Just put me in it with you. It's great. And they were like, of course. So I made it as easy as I could on these authors that are part of these box sets. Uh, and there are, some, there are some really prolific, fantastic authors who I've been looking up to for years that I now have my name on the, on the cover with them. Uh, and I made it as easy as I could. I went out of my way to help them. And they, in turn, reciprocate. Not all of them. Uh, it's not 100%. Some people will take your goodwill and say goodbye. That's life. That happens. Uh, but you keep doing it. So these five I organized. This one here in the bottom right is just coming out today. I didn't organize it, but I'm part of it. Uh, and, and it's probably going to be my last multi-author box set. If you're thinking like, oh, multi-author box sets. All right, Mr. Thorne, thanks for that. Unfortunately, I think this is kind of running its course, uh, both from the Amazon side and from the reader side. So I don't know if I'm going to do any more, but uh, I'm already on to the next thing. Uh, this is some a uh, book on Permafree that I got on Amazon based on sales. I'm doing a little bit of consulting work, so if you need some one-on-one -on -one help. Uh, I relaunched a podcast today with co-host uh, Richard Brown, so we're going to talk about writing and horror and all, all that kind of fun stuff. And this came out last week, and this is what I'm really proud of. This is the culmination of everything I shared with you today. This is called The Black Fang Betrayal. It's a collaborative novel. <laughs> I was the project manager, go figure, right? What I did was I, I asked nine other authors to write a story with me. And this is not an anthology, it's not a box set, it's not a collection of random short stories. It is 10 authors writing a single novel together. Uh, and it's, it's, I'm really proud of it. It, it launched last week. Um, we, we have we're close to 40 reviews on it right now. It's selling really well. It's, it's very different. 
So I would encourage you to check it out. It's sort of the culmination of everything that I've been working for uh, for these past couple of years. I'm really proud of it. So really, my story is comes down to this. Take chances. When those opportunities arise, even if you can't figure it out and you don't know how you're going to do it, say yes anyways. You will be amazed at how your brain will figure out solutions to things you don't think you can, you can do. Give of yourself without expectation. It's, it's counterintuitive to a lot of where we are right now. This is, a bit, this is a meat culture. What can I get? What can I grab? I'm saying go against that. I'm saying give of yourself and it will come back to you. And always, just keep writing. Through all of this, you have to keep writing. You have to keep growing and developing your voice. I wanted to save at least a few minutes for questions. Uh, so if you would uh, please come up. As Joe said, it would be really embarrassing if no one comes up and asks anything. So maybe at least one person could come up and would be great. Thank you. OK, you're so prolific. And I'm so short. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure everybody would want you to share. Oh, that's all right. Um, you know, what your day-to-day -day, um, organization is as far as everything that you do and getting these books out there, because it's hard to write a book, and it takes me a long time, so. Yeah, it takes me a long time to write a book, too. Um, I have a very, uh, in fact, I, this interview just went up on sterlingandstone.net, Johnny and Sean's um, company. I did an interview called Eight Questions with David Wright, and I talked about my daily writing routine. Uh, really, it's, it's about consistency and accountability. It's about, uh, even if you can only write for 20 minutes a day, do it every single day. So a, tip, a typical novel of mine uh, is probably 60 to 70,000 words. I'm, I started out aiming for 1,000 words a day. I can now get about 3,000 words a day, and so if I sit down and I do it every day, I can have a first draft done in about a month. Now, you might be thinking, there's no way I can do that, and you don't have to, but you would be surprised at how quickly that writing muscle builds up. You just gotta start small. It's like running. Like, if you're gonna run a marathon, you don't start running 10 miles a day. You know, you start with a mile, and you build up. And as you, but if you gotta do it every single day, uh, Stephen King's famous for saying he, he doesn't write on his birthday or Christmas day, that's it. Those are the only two days he takes off. So even if you can only get 10 words out a day, do it every day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had a, Pete Jenner, I had a similar experience with uh, editing. Uh, I published, self-published a novel, and I had, had like, a, I wasn't very smart, I had a relative <laughs> edit it. Editing wasn't very good, and I got the similar reviews. Uh, have you ever, did you ever know what a spell check is? Things like that. So uh, then I got a, a second edition where I had a real good editing and it came out a lot better. But I couldn't get rid of those reviews. Is there a way to get rid of those first edition, to separate the first edition from the second edition? Come on, they build character. Those, those one star reviews build character. They, they're scars that you can, you can come up and present to a room full of 150 people and, and be, embarrass yourself. No, in, in all seriousness, you can, there's nothing you can do about the reviews. In fact, good reviews or bad reviews, uh, I would like to tell you not to read them at all, but I, I, I'd be a hypocrite because I read every one. But you really shouldn't. Um, the truth is, the reviews are for readers, and sometimes I'll see authors will comment on reviews. I personally don't do that. I feel like the review space is for readers, and I should stay out of that. Uh, because I don't want to influence that, and it's really for them, it's not for the author. However, you can manage reviews. So one of the things that you can do, especially on Amazon, is you can, there's the vote up or down. So you can ask your, your followers, your hardcore fans, hey, you know what, can you, if, would you mind voting this one review down? It's not accurate. So maybe it's a one-star review that says you kill puppies, right? And you don't, you don't kill puppies, but they say you do. Amazon won't remove it, don't try. But you can have people vote it down and say that's not really relevant. So there, you can manage them, but ultimately there's nothing you can do about reviews, and you have to live with them. And if you can't, if you can't take the good ones with the with the, I wish no stars was an option, this might not be the business for you. It's kind of brutal.
I'm great, thanks. How are you? I'm good, thanks. I appreciate your willingness to share your uh, your downs as well as your ups. <laughs> um, Thank you. I got a question for you. So, I mean, I found it very interesting how you had sort of that, um, what was it, the, the free parte thing, and then that's where you sort of hit it. Yeah. Um, now, after that, though, insofar as it, and it looks like you're going from you know two to two hundred books a day, so to speak, is there anything that you were doing from a marketing standpoint, or anything that you've been doing on a regular basis to keep those numbers up? Not really. So I, I know this is a marketing conference, and I know there are going to be some marketers up that have come up and will come up and share great tips. I'm going to be taking notes with you because. Uh, I think like many of us, I didn't really start thinking of myself as a marketer until uh, very recently. And I, I give Jim a lot of credit. He was the one who is like, he's like, dude, come on. Here's what you got to do. Like, you got to start a podcast. You got you to gotta do this. And Jim's been a great, great help for me in realizing this is a business. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm not just a writer. So to answer your question, the only thing you can, the thing you can do now is keep writing. Nothing sells books like more books. That's, I mean, that is it. Like it doesn't, you, there's other things you can do. You'll get, you can buy advertising, you'll get these temporary spikes and then you'll fall back off. You know, I've been at 87 on the horror list. I've been five, I've been 50. I've, been, I've sold 200 books a day. I've sold two a day, I've sold 20 a day. You get these, you get these fluctuations and variations. And so yes, you can market. There's great strategies and I'm gonna, I wanna learn how to do that as well. The only thing I know for sure is writing more books. Uh, I think if you're planning on one book and then like sit back and see what happens, I think you might be disappointed because that, that one book sort of launching a career is just so rare, whether it's traditional or, or self-published. Am I good on time? Uh, if you want to take another question, head out. Sure. You gotta go up to the mic, please. And when you guys are going up, um, say your name and even the title of your book if you want. Yeah, plug away, right? See, I told you, he's a marketing guy, right? He knows exactly what I, I really enjoyed your, your lecture. It was very Thank funny, you. very funny. Uh, what I wanted to know is in the 10 author project, Yes. how did you keep the 10 authors from killing each other? <laughs> in my case, that's what happened. All right, uh, yeah, the, the 10 author collaboration, the Black Fang Betrayals. Uh, th thank you, that's a great question. I, I didn't always. In fact, uh, I'm writing a blog post right now that I'm probably going to publish maybe next Monday or the, or the Monday after. It's called Seven Ways to, to, to Do One of These If You're an Introvert, um, uh, which I am, so even coming up here is, is a challenge. Uh, I think it comes down to a lot of organizational skills. So if, if you're naturally organized and you're good at managing stuff, this is the type of project you can find a lot of success. Yes, but they didn't want to do that. <laughs> well, here's the thing too. There are ten authors. Right. I asked over a hundred. And one manager. <laughs> so I asked. I asked over a hundred to get ten. And after I had ten, I had two drop out. And I had to replace. So it's not easy. I'm not. I'm not going to suggest it's easy. But if you're, you know, in, in project management, you kind of have to know when to lead and when to kind of sit back, and you have to try and find the right people. I didn't do open calls either. I I asked. I solicited. Um, so, I know that's not a, a full answer, but I promise on my blog on jthorn.net in the next week or so, I'm going to have a, a really detailed explanation of some of the very tangible things I did to pull this off. Okay, appreciate it. All right, thank you, James. Thank you. You're awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much.